you pray with me? Father, this is such an appropriate song for us at this time. There's so much stuff going on. Lord, not just with the pandemic, but people who are whose lives have been turned upside down. People who have lost loved ones. There's so much dissension and strife going on in our communities. Lord, help us to not get distracted with the menial, but to focus on you. To know that you have us, that you are protecting us, that you are working these things out for your honor and your glory. Because you have conquered death. Jesus is alive and we have Jesus inside of us to go and tell others what he has done. Because you are holy and worthy. Father, we love you. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of your plan. Help us to listen to learn, to grow, to be more like you, and to let others see Jesus in us when we leave here. It's in his name we pray. Amen. You can have a seat. Uh, before I get going too far, I do want to say thank you to those who have worked and continue to work on the parsonage. Uh, it's not fully painted, but boy, it's going to look good when it is finished, and I appreciate all the effort that's gone into that. Seems like January just flew by. It is the last day of January, and it seems like I just was on overdrive. Right around the corner, we have uh, Valentine's Day. Guys, are you paying attention? Okay, ladies, I got your notes. Please tell my husband. Let Valent no, not really. They didn't yet. But anyway, it's right around the corner. Uh, then right after that, it's what, spring break? Uh, right after spring break, we get Easter, and then after Easter, it seems like summer is here. You know, how's that for flying by five months and just going boom, right past us? Uh, but... Instead of flying by this, uh, this morning, let's take a moment, let's hit the brakes and pause, and let the Holy Spirit speak to us. I, I was intending, speaking of flying by, I was intending to finish 2 Timothy chapter 2 today, verses 14 through 26, and was in preparation Monday and Tuesday, and it just felt like the Holy Spirit was saying, you need to slow down. There's some things here that we need to rest on, we need to sit on, and allow the Father to speak to us about. So we are going to be back in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 14 through 18, not all the way to 26 today. And you see the title here is Don't Babble. Now, married couples, don't elbow your spouse and say, Shh, he's talking to you. Or parents, don't elbow your kids and say, be quiet, he's talking to you. It's not necessarily the number of words, but... Paul specifically is talking about the kind of words that we use. And we're going to get into that today. So to kind of prime the pump, let me start with this. What was the last thing that you said, texted, emailed, or posted, so you got me, that was rude, crass, irreverent, let me say that again, irreverent or condescending? Easy for me to say. We used to teach our children a rhyme that went like this, and I think we've learned that it's, we shouldn't teach our kids this because it's wrong, but it used to go something like this. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. We've learned that that's completely false, haven't we? We've learned that many times words do far more damage than sticks and stones. And no, that's not permission for you to throw things up here, okay? But, We've learned that words are powerful. So that's where we're going to be going here. 2 Timothy 2, 14 through 18. Remind them of these things. Let's just stop. What's he saying? Okay, so he mentions it. Last week we talked about the, the fact that we are strengthened by grace. And we need to be strengthened by grace every day. Grace is not just something that we receive at salvation, but it's something that we can receive daily, not because we earn it or we can do certain things, tick off a checklist and say, boom, I've got my daily amount of grace. Yeehaw. No, no, God gives it to us willingly because he loves us, not because we do certain things. So remind them of these things and charge them before God not to quarrel about words which does no good but only ruins the hearers. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, 
a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. But avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, two new guys. Oh boy, we get to learn about several guys here. Who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They are upsetting the faith of some. Uh, that would be an understatement. That would be quite concerning if people were going around saying that here in our church. Let's go back to verse 14. Uh, remind them of these things and charge them before God not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruin the hearer. So Paul is saying, remind them to be strengthened by grace, but also remember there have been people that have abandoned, not just me, Paul saying that, not just abandoned me, but they have abandoned the gospel. And so to avoid abandoning the gospel, remember to be strengthened by grace daily. Paul is encouraging Timothy to avoid these false teachers and to confront these false teachers with the truth of the gospel. And that's why he emphasizes grace and continues to do that. Some of these false teachers were known as Gnostics. Uh, it went along with the Greek philosophy of the day, but they also kind of twisted it a little bit more. The Gnostics believed that all this stuff that we see, this physical world, this material world, was of no value, no significance. Anything that was of value and mattered was the spiritual and the spiritual world. Now, let's just think about this. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created. By devaluing what we see, what is in the material world, we are saying that what God created isn't good. So right away, we see that the Gnostics had a wrong theology about creation and God himself. But not just that. The Gnostics like to produce fanciful words and long phrases and then divide people with their words. They, you know, the, the Greek philosophers, Aristotle, Plato, I almost said Pluto, uh, Plato and others, uh, they, they were known for their great thinking and these Gnostics took that to another level and focused on these long words and try to get people to think and go, hmm, and then try to divide people with that. The problem was they had no action to their words. We as Jesus people need to make sure that we don't just get caught up in right theology. The Gnostics had wrong theology. But let's not just get caught up in right theology and uh, say, okay, this is who God is. This is all that, that he says he is. That's great stuff. But then it should work out of us into right actions. We're going to get into that. Uh, there are circles and evangelicals that are great thinkers but god isn't just stopping up here at our heads it comes out in our lives how we love people how we talk to people how we treat one another the gnostics were great at taking the humanity out of jesus and parsing words and phrases creating controversies james chapter 1 verse 22 but be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. As I said, the Gnostics like to talk and talk along theological lines about God. We as Jesus people want to live it out, not just talk about it. Second Timothy 2.15, the second verse here. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Well, in discussing the need to be strengthened by grace, last week we looked at Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. You probably have it memorized, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. So we are saved at salvation. We need grace every day. But Paul continues in verse 10, said, for we are his workmanship. Turn to your neighbor, if you're sitting by someone, say, you're his workmanship. Now, in case they don't know what that means, I'm going to give you another way to say it. Tell them that you are God's fine art. 
That's what that word means. You are God's fine art, His masterpiece. Now think about this. For we are His masterpiece created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So we are strengthened by grace, we're saved by grace for the purpose of getting out and doing the things that God has created us to do. We don't just sit and think about God. We get out and we do the things of God. Now, Paul, talking to Timothy, says, be a... uh, Let me find it here. Verse There we go. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed. This word ashamed, oftentimes we relate it to sin and being guilt and shamed for the things that we've done in the past. That's not what he's referring to. He's saying present yourself to God as a masterpiece. Don't be ashamed of who you are, who God has already created you to be. Now, a lot of us, even in this building, often are attacked by Satan in the areas of guilt and shame because of something you've done, maybe something you haven't forgiven yourself of, though God has forgiven you. Listen carefully. Jesus has already taken that away. You are forgiven. You don't need to wallow around in guilt and shame when Jesus has already removed it. Guilt and shame are Satan's two favorite tools to use in our heart and in our lives. And Jesus has removed them. So be strengthened by grace, live out of his grace, and be the masterpiece that God has created you to be. Now, Paul also says, rightly handling the word of truth. And this is something that I think we do something very well here at First Baptist Church, and this is not William patting himself on, on the back. Matter of fact, I'm pushing that off onto our small groups. You guys do an awesome job of handling the word of truth, opening the word of God, reading God's word, and having it taught in your small groups. This is something you guys do an awesome job of. But how do we handle the word of truth? We open the word of God daily. We get into it. We read it. Now, how many of you, when you were first saved, you weren't quite sure of how to read the Bible? Be honest. You can be honest in here. It's safe. Okay, some of you aren't being honest, but that's okay. I had some hands raised. I know you did. I know you had some trouble with it. Well, how we, ha- how we get past that is by opening the Word of God. We read it. Maybe we ask somebody to explain some things to us, get involved in community, and read God's Word and have the group help us with it. If you don't know where to start, start in the book of John. It's a great book to start in. If you've already been in there, go back to Matthew, read the Gospels until you understand Jesus better and better. Once you understand Jesus more and more, then you can get into the letters to the churches. It reminds me of when Lisa and I first moved here, uh, I had some guys ask me to bay fish with them, and I barely fished when we moved here. So I didn't really know how to fish very well at all. And had me go buy a rod and a reel as an open-faced reel. I'd never worked with an open face reel before. I didn't know what this thing was or how to work it, so I started casting out, and I get a bird nest after bird nest right here in my open face reel. Some of you don't know, but lying all over the place. But I kept working at it, kept working at it, and now I can kind of handle myself with a rod and reel. Sometimes I catch fish, sometimes I don't. But I've learned, and that's how we grow in the Word of God, is we get into it, we use it, we read it, We invite people to help us with it. Now, verses 16 through 18. Let me remind you of what he says here. But avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Pilatus, who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They are upsetting the faith of some. It's upsetting me right now, even as I read that. Why would they say something like that? Paul calls out two guys who are creating dissension by starting lies about Jesus, but using this Gnostic train of thought, yet they put their own spin on it. What they were saying was, 
the spiritual is what mattered, but we still had our spirit in us until we were baptized. And once we were baptized in Jesus, then the spirit was released into heaven, and all this other stuff didn't matter. You could go on and do whatever you wanted to because it just didn't matter out here. It's only what mattered with our spirit. But let's back up a bit here. This irreverent babbling, verse 16. But avoid irreverent, irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. So keep the slide up right there where you have it. Paul is using a medical terminology, and he's using a Greek term that I want us to understand here. First of all, the word for babble is the Greek word kenophania, which means simply empty disputing or worthless babble. It's a general term for, for vain talk, for just empty speech, not uh, giving honor where honor is due, not lifting up, rather discouraging and cutting down. So it's not just theological babble, it's empty talk that leads to nothing good. Then he says, but avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Now this is interesting because around Ephesus, where Timothy was, he had some ranchers and farmers who had farm animals. And they were familiar that at times, one of the, the sheep, generally sheep or goats in their flock, would get sick. Sometimes if it wasn't attended to, that specific animal disease would get into their skin and then into the blood. And if they didn't handle it pro appropriately, they'd have to amputate. Well, and just a little bit about gangrene. Gangrene is a serious condition that can, that can result in amputation of a limb or death. It needs urgent treatment to halt the spread of tissue disease as rapidly as possible. So what Paul is saying as a rancher would know, they would have an animal and it might be infected, but the disease would be stopped and halted unless that animal got back into the flock and the animal started rubbing up against one another real close in the pen and it would spread from animal to animal. Paul is using that analogy that with our mouths, the way we irreverent babble with one another, that it will spread and the disease will spread among the flock, the body of Christ. Our words infect and create issues that spread throughout the body of Christ. I want you to flip over to James chapter 3, 1 through 12. I was going to paraphrase this, it's you know, 12 verses, but James does such a great job I don't need to paraphrase. I think the word can stand on its own. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole body as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. Stop just for a second. James is using a couple analogies of what people could relate to. They see these huge, magnificent horses, yet they were guided by a bit and bridle in their mouth. These ships of the day, big vessels for the day, they were guided by a very small rudder at the back of the, of the ship. Verse 5. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a force is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of bird, excuse me, every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. I believe our version should have a question mark, not necessarily a period there, because I, I believe James is saying we can do this, we can do that, but you can't tame the tongue. I'll prove it here in a minute. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Father, Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who 
are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursings. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. That's my point right there. James is saying, we tame all these other things. We need to learn to tame our tongues. Verse 11, does the spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, not my fig tree, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. James points out, these type of trees, they don't produce multiple types of fruit. It's not like going to the produce section at one tree. You have to have specific trees for a specific fruit. That's the way our tongues should be. If we are Jesus people, we should get one type of speech coming out of our mouth. It doesn't mean we can't have appropriate conversations, but the way we speak to people should be pointing people to Jesus, even in the hard and difficult conversations. Let's continue here. Our words can be extremely beneficial and encouraging, or we can set the whole town on fire with our words. I don't know if you've seen footage from forest fires. Uh, it can be devastating. Listen carefully. The, our locals here in Port Aransas, I'm not belittling anything that we went through during Hurricane Harvey. I, in a lot of ways, I think we're still recovering from PTSD from Hurricane Harvey. But if you've ever seen footage from a fire raging, especially around California area, rolling over the hills and entering into a community where people literally have minutes to leave, the fire rolls through. They're, they come back to see if anything's left, and oftentimes it's just a slab. And those pictures leave me breathless, gasping for air of the destruction that a fire can cause. Proverbs 15, 1. Proverbs has a lot to say about the tongue. I'm just going to use two verses. A soft answer turns away wrath. But a harsh word stirs up anger. And then Proverbs 18.21, the verse we started with today. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. I had to think about this for a little bit. Those who love it, what are they loving? Well, those who love the fact that they give life, and that they are able to produce life and encouragement in people's lives, they will reap the fruit of encouraging and producing life in others. Those who love the power of destruction and discouragement in people's lives will eventually reap what they've sown with their mouth. Now, I don't know about you. All this talk about babbling and irreverent babbling is convicting in my own life. And it reminds me of a time when I allowed my tongue to control my body. I was... 8th or ninth grade, still living at home, of course. I was in the living room one day, and I heard my mother on the phone talking to her friend, who is a member of our church. And it sounded like they were having a great conversation, except it was a juicy gossip kind of conversation. And me being a teenage boy, I had a crush on a girl, and I thought, hmm, here's an excuse to call a girl. So I called my friend Bobby, who was a member of our church, uh, but wasn't, uh, didn't attend the same school that I went to, so I was looking for a reason to call her and said, hey, guess what I heard? And I passed on the juicy piece of gossip. And the problem was the piece of gossip didn't stay with Bobby. She spread it, and that person spread it and got back to my mom's friend, got back to my mom, of course got back to me. That was one time my parents didn't have to punish me because I had a front row seat of the fire that I had caused with my mouth in my own house and in my own church. Our tongues are a raging fire if we allow them to create death and not life. This was one time where I allowed my tongue to control my body. What about you? Are you involved in gossip? Or maybe it's slander. Maybe you have a habit of being completely discouraging to those around you at work, at school, teenagers, with your family members, within your house. You're not encouraging them. 
irreverent babble. And then, of course, there's the things we post online. The things we text to one another. The comments we put at the end of a web page. And no one's going to see this. I'm just going to let them know how I feel. Are we pointing people to Jesus? I do believe, listen carefully, I do believe that believers, Jesus people, can redeem social media. And I believe that it should be redeemed. But we have to be oh so careful. If we're going to point people to Jesus, let's point them to Jesus, not point them to self. Here's our bottom line. My words can give life or bring death. Pretty simple. It's simple on purpose. What are your words bringing? If your words were seeds, what fruit would be popping up? Proverbs 18.21 Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Here's the, excuse me, here's the question for all of us. My guess is the Holy Spirit's convicting you about some, something regarding your tongue because we're all guilty at one point or another of not planting the seeds that point people to Jesus. So after confessing to the Father, to whom do I need to confess and apologize about my words? Yes, I do believe we need to confess to the Father. If you're a Jesus person, you have Jesus in your life, Confess it. But is there someone else that you need to approach and confess to? Are we encouraging or discouraging one another? Whether it's text, post, emails, or in person, our words have power. What does our community hear in our words right in here? Won't you bow your head and close your eyes for a moment? My words, your words, our words can bring life or they can bring death. Where have you participated in irreverent babbling? Now, for those of you in here, I've been speaking to people who already have a relationship with Jesus. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, the most important thing you need to know is that Jesus loves you. And he works in our hearts and lives and convicts us of things that help us be more like him. But you have to have a relationship with him first. And if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, I want to encourage you. Talk to me, talk to one of the members on stage, that maybe you know them. Talk to us about what it means to have a relationship with Jesus. If you're involved in a small group, talk to your small group leader. They'd love to talk with you about that. Father, we come to you this morning thanking you for Jesus, for how he moves and works in our heart and our minds. Father, I pray that you would help us as Jesus people to think about the words we use. Not that we don't need to have conversations with other people, but Lord, may those conversations point others to Jesus. Help us not to be about cutting other people down and discouraging people, but bringing life to them in a way that points them back to Jesus. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for all you do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, before you go, uh, you heard about steps. If you are interested in knowing more about steps, Thomas is going to be at the guest table in the foyer. Find him. He can tell you more about it. Otherwise, I hope to see you in small groups.